Hey, welcome to the Genius Podcast. It's fantastic to have you back with us. We've been so blessed by your interviews over the past 12 months, but I know that the women are just going to be really blessed to this by this conversation today. So thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Karen. It is a delight to be back. <laughs> We're in the middle of summer here where I am. You're in the middle of winter, so I have all the frizzies going on. So it's like oh. its own end. Yeah. <laughs> you look great. And I've got my heater cranked here. <laughs> it's freezing. There you go. <laughs> yeah. And we're also opposite times of the day. So I'm morning and you're at the end of the day. So yes, ma'am. Yes. So we've we've a prayed way into to close the... Out the day. Sorry. I said a beautiful way to close out the day. Yeah, and start the day for us. So thank you. But I think um today, last time when we spoke, um, we spoke about your first book that you'd published and since then you've published a second book and I'm keen for you just to tell us about the distinction between the two because I love both of their titles and I might let you share a little bit about the distinction. Sure well the first book called Be Brave and the Scared was really all about facing hard things Mm -hmm. um basically the the natural consequences of choices made in our life we walked through the story of uh, my marriage, um, our daughter, Courtney, who had special needs, our son, um, dealing with um, addiction within the marriage, uh, myself to food, my husband to pornography, uh, dealing with special needs child over the course of 22 years, um, and just all of the things. And how God was constantly present. He never left us. I didn't really recognize him in the beginning, but he never left us. He was always with us. And he was calling us to be brave right? To be brave in that moment when you're terrified and you're not sure how to be brave and that he provided at every step of the way that courage to be brave. The second book is called Be Bold and the Broken and it's all about courage and finding my voice. And it really comes from the perspective of, I use, uh, I use an analogy throughout the book of trying on clothes. You're in a dressing room, okay. right? And you have, you have the, um, that horrible light that's in a dressing room in a in a in a department yes. store <laughs> and i i equate it to the to the whisper of satan because it's just horrible it makes you look horrible like you have a liver disease it's just awful but you're you're there and you're trying things on you're trying to be you're trying to figure out who you are yeah. right who am i called to be as mary lenneberg who did god call me to be um what are my gifts what are my talents what are my charisms And I called it Be Bold and the Broken because for so many years, I pursued a persona that was not who God called me to be. Mm -hmm. And in order to be fully Mary, I had to break, you know, and, and you think of, um, you think of deeps, uh, for instance, you're in the middle of winter. So you've got ice fishing. You have to saw a hole in the ice in order to fish. In order to be fed, you have to break something, right? So in order for me to become me, God had to allow a breaking to happen Mm -hmm. over the course of time again and again and again until I was willing to allow him as the clay in the potter's hands to be rebuilt Mm -hmm. into the woman he was calling me to be. And that woman happens to love sequins dresses and not the little black dress. That woman happens to love bold patterns and great statement earrings. Um, I am not demure, but I am feminine. And so there was just this journey that I have taken over the course of my 53 years of life where I've learned these lessons to be courageous in the authentic individual that God has called me to be. I am unique and unrepeatable. I am made in his image and likeness, as are you, as are each and every woman who is listening to this podcast. And so for me to be you would be boring because then there's a lot of you around. Yeah. But for me to be me is, is what God intended because I have a mission that is uniquely mine. That's right. It's not your mission. It's not my sister's mission. It's not my mother's mission. It's my mission. And if I don't do my mission, then it goes undone. Mm-hmm. But I need to be me in order to do it. What does that mean? That means I need to be who God made me to be. Yeah. I have gifts. I have talents. I have the charism of hospitality. I have the charism of wisdom and mercy. And those work with my personality. 
they work with how my body is formed. They work with, uh, you know, how I interact with people and how I uh, bring the face of Christ, hopefully, to every person that I meet. And they create a life that's mine. I do not envy my neighbor. I am not jealous of my girlfriend because they have their own missions. Amen. I have mine. So instead of comparing, we celebrate. Instead of envy, we have encouragement. Yeah. Instead of jealousy, we, we bring joy. And so that's what Be Bold and the Broken is about. So one really kind of encompasses my marriage and my family life. And one is really kind of my journey. Yes. Um, uniquely mine to becoming the woman that, that is here today. And who God created you to be. Amen. Yeah, I think you're right. I think so many women do get trapped in that comparison trap and that wheel of comparison where they're measuring their success and their gifts against other women's. And we see this all the time. But as women, we can't flourish and step into the fullness of who God made us to be when we're on that path. I think well, he, you know, and he didn't make us to to compare to one another. Right. He didn't. Um, you cannot compare my day one to somebody else's day 528. That's right. Right. And, and social media, you know, social media is an edited magazine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so what you see are everybody's highlight reel. Yes. You're not seeing all the work it goes into bringing the highlight reel. You're just seeing the highlights. And so then to look at that and then to look at your world and go, gosh, my living room doesn't look like that gosh, I can't cook that way. Gosh, their kids look so sweet and well behaved. Well, you didn't see them have a fit for the last two. Well, they got the photo. (laughs) Exactly. Was making them wear some dress that they didn't like. Right. Right. So, I mean, we have to remember that, you know, our lives are meant to look different. Mm -hmm. They're meant to not look the same. We're not cookie cutters. No. Right. We are unique individuals built uniquely we worship differently we pray differently we have different marriages you know some men and women are very um they're very gregarious with their affection for each other others are very subtle you know Mm -hmm. but both marriages are strong and beautiful Mm -hmm. so it's just you know we, we have to stop we have to look to scripture or actually i'll i'll even quote saint Therese of Lazou, where she said, remember that the roses don't compare themselves to the sunflowers and they don't compare themselves to the lilies. They're all happy and they're all beautiful in their uniqueness because God made them so. Absolutely. So why are we comparing ourselves to each other? Yeah. And the, I think there's another part in that quote where she says, you know, they make up this beautiful bouquet and they together, the, you know, there's that beauty that is in the, the fullness of the bouquet. But if they're all the same, it would be lovely, but not quite what God had created it to be. No, because he created this beautiful tapestry, Yeah, you know, and he's, and, and the other thing is, is he's not done with us yet. Mm-hmm. As long as there is breath in our body, there is work for us to do. There is, there are gifts and talents to bring forth into the world. Yes. So we're never done until we take our last breath and we're standing at those gates. Amen. And, um, and I think we forget that sometimes we, we think, Oh, I've raised my kids. I'm done. Mm-hmm. No sister. Mm-mm, you're not done. You're just getting started. You're going to take everything you've learned from raising those kids. And you're now going to pour into, if God so grants you grandchildren, great, but there's a whole world of kids that need you. Yeah. There's your youth at your, your parish. There's your next door neighbor's daughter. There's your best friend's little girl. I mean, there's all these people that need you. You're not done because you just, you finished this one season of your life. You now open the doors to a new season. And then when that season comes to an end, there can be another season. And so God is continually using everything that we've gone through, all of our experiences, all of our failures, all of our triumphs, all of our victories. He uses it all. He never wastes anything Mm -hmm. to continue to bring us along the journey as we walk toward him. Absolutely. And I think that we, we have to remember that I see so many women in our sisterhood community here in Australia. Um, actually, a number of years ago, there was a conference. There was a woman there in her 80s and she was so sweet. And she said she felt like she passed her use by date. And the one thing that a 
you know, woke her soul up was these younger girls who basically had not been mothered and they were really like craving her wisdom. And it was this beautiful intergenerational exchange of the wisdom being imparted, but that joy of youthfulness sort of reigniting something with her. And I think there we, we have to remember that every season has a purpose and a mission and it changes but I think it also is tied back to this, you know, being created in the image and likeness of God and being created unique and unrepeatable means that he's given us this unique design. And so that will look different throughout different seasons, but often there's a common thread. Like you were talking about your gifts being hospitality, wisdom, mercy. They have looked different throughout the different seasons of your life, but there's that basic motivational design within you that, that's been there since the beginning of time. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and my name is Mary Elizabeth. Oh, so great. my feast day is the visitation. Oh. And you want to talk about multi-generational ministry. Yeah. You yeah. know, here we have the beautiful Mary, you know, our lady who um, said yes, right, was asked a question, but because she had no sin, was able to freely give her yes. After asking a very, you know, very practical question, she's like, how? Can you explain oh, how? And she's, you know, a typical woman. Just tell me how. Oh, okay. I understand. And then she said, yes. Right. And what is the next thing she did? She went in haste to serve another woman who was older than her, the next generation above her who, and you want to talk about a faithful woman. Here's Elizabeth who knew, who knew and never, ever, ever wavered. She knew God would give her a child. She knew it. And she prayed in that temple and she was faithful and she was obedient. Yeah. And she had no idea how it was going to happen. And here the Lord blesses her. Her husband, he had some doubts. He had to be quiet for a little while, right? But yeah. here she was going, no, I know it. And so here's these two women in scripture, two generations of women that come together to do at the beginning of the most amazing story ever told. Mm-hmm. At the beginning of the most radically miraculous life that would ever unfold on earth. And that is of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And so we're called to be them. Maybe you are, maybe Mary, sorry. Maybe you are Mary at the beginning of your journey and God's asking you some hard things. And you're like, okay, I can do that. Maybe you're an Elizabeth who's waiting for that miracle that you have been praying for, for decades, just waiting in receivership for that. Mm-hmm. So God is asking us, to be in community. He's asking us as women, like that beautiful example you shared of the 80 year old going, I'm past my, you know, sell by date. No, she's not. Like I said, if there's breath in your body, there's work for you to do. She's just getting started. She's now introduced to a whole new generation of women where she can share her experience. We as women are made to shelter another soul as St. Teresa of Avila said, we're made to shelter another soul. Whether we shelter them of our body or not makes no difference. We are made for spiritual motherhood. Yeah, absolutely. And therefore, this generational um, service that we can offer one another, it's natural to us. It's part of our feminine genius. And when we deny it is when we get into trouble. And that's where the comparison comes in. That's yeah. where the jealousy and the envy comes in. And, and that's where it all begins to come apart. But mm-hmm. yeah, we were made for community. We were made to walk together intergenerationally. Uh, we were made to encourage one another. Um, we were made to love one another. Yeah. Amen. It's, it's so true. And we see this played out all the time. I see it in sisterhood, particularly at our conferences where we have that exchange and just that giftedness of the generations coming together. And I think what also happens is when we can, when we're secure, when we've received our identity as the beloved, like I think that is our starting place because We can't go out and do things. We can't discover our gifts unless we're grounded in this identity because otherwise then we're stepping out, we're seeking validation from other people, we're using our gifts to advance a different agenda. But I think it's that core receiving, first of all, our identity because it's a gift. It's already been done. We don't have to do anything to get it. It's already given to us. So it's receiving our identity as the beloved. And then all of our gifts and the things that, flow from that place 
literally flow from that place without any sort of work striving. I mean, we have to steward our gifts. We have to discover what they are and cultivate them. But then when it comes to actually activating those, they, they do flow. There is a flow to them. Wouldn't you That's agree? The beauty. I would totally agree. It's the beauty of the feminine genius. And again, I'll bring you back to our lady. What did she do? She received first. Absolutely. That reset. First thing she did was receive. And so, and she knew who she was. She knew who God made her to be because she could hear him. She was in relationship with him. There was nothing blocking his voice from her. So she receives him. And then what does she do? She ponders. She keeps these things in her heart. She's, she's asking the how. She's having that intimate conversation. It's prayer for us, right? First, we receive the Lord and we're talking with him and we're figuring it out. Like, where do I put my foot next? Where's the next step for me? What's the next right thing for me to do? And then what does Mary teach us to do? We go and we act. Yes. We begin to give, yeah. right? And so we as women are called to receive. We're called to hold it close, but to hold it loosely mm -hmm. and then to give it forth and to go out in action. Yeah. And we have to know who we are in God in order to even receive. My mom used to say to me all the time, you cannot love another person until you love yourself. And I'm not talking a prideful love. I'm mm -hmm. talking the kind of love that God has for us in our identity as women, mm -hmm. that I am a woman. And he made me with a feminine genius that is unique to me. Mm -hmm. And he made me with a purpose and a plan. And he loves me. Mm -hmm. And he's not going to abandon me but the world is messed up with sin. And so he sent his son to show me the way. And anything that I am going to be asked to endure, anything I'm going to be asked to give, anything that I'm going to be asked to walk through, Jesus has already shown me how to do it mm. because he did it first. Yeah. And our lady was with him. Yes. She loved him from the beginning to the end and through eternity. Again, she loved him from the beginning. She received him. And then she pondered and stayed with him, raised him, loved him. And then what happens? She acts, she gives him forth to the world. You look at the beautiful art of the statue by Michelangelo called the Pieta. I love that. And what is Our Lady doing? Our Lady's not looking at Jesus. She's looking at you. Mm -hmm. Her hands are not gripping her son and holding them close to her. They are completely open in offering. Mm -hmm. I received him. I loved him. Yeah. I offer him back to you to do the same. Yeah. And so if he is giving you a, a task that seems insurmountable, that seems so difficult. If there's a financial difficulty, there's a challenge with a child, there's a challenging marriage, there's loss of a job. I mean, the world is insane right now. There's all of those things times 12 million. And we're being asked to face hard things. The first thing we have to do in that situation is receive our Lord, mm -hmm. to receive the strength and the wisdom and the grace to be able to ponder that, right? To put on his armor, mm. to put on that armor of God, because what's going to happen? We're going to have to go to battle. We're going to have to go to fight. We're going to have to fight for ourselves. We're going to have to fight for our children, for our husbands, for our countries, for our communities, for our church. And that's where we, many of us find ourselves today. We are in a battle. But if we don't know who we are, then how are we going to know what to offer in that fight? Absolutely. And there's two, I think there's two levels as I'm listening to you talk, there's this level of discovering our own personal vocation, like where we're called to serve with these gifts. But you, you're right. And you, you're so true. Like I love the titles of your book because being broken in the scared, being now if I've got it right, being now I'm getting them all. Brave and the scared and bold and the scared, broken. Bold and the broken. But the broken and the scared is where I think a lot of people around the entire globe are finding themselves right now, um, whether that's church or government or the pandemic, whatever it is, and how that's affected people, the lockdowns. 
I think a lot of people are in this state of crisis where they are scared and they are broken. So we've got this level of discovering our personal vocation, but then we've also got this level now where we have to dig a little deeper um, so that we can embrace this suffering, these trials that we are in the midst of right now at this moment of history. So I think those two, I mean, they're almost two different conversations, aren't they? There's that personal vocation. Yes and no. Yes and no. They are, they feel like two different conversations, but they're really one. And it comes down to faith. It comes down to faith, hope, and love. And why I say that is this, we have been stripped of our identity, of some of our freedoms around the world during this time of pandemic right? We have been stripped of personal freedoms that we never thought we would have to let go of, or actually I didn't let go of anything. It was taken from me. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we have to look then to that sacrificial love of Jesus on the cross. Mm -hmm. It was all taken from him. He allowed it to be taken from him so that he could enter into a suffering that was redemptive, restorative, and resurrected Mm -hmm. for us. And so when we have this battle with our identity, with our vocation, um, I was in confession today and the priest told me when he was counseling me, he said, Mary, your call to sainthood happens within your vocation. Uh, My vocation is as a wife and mother. My call to sainthood, my sainthood happens within that. And so in order to understand what my vocation is, I have to look at those three things. I have to have faith in a God who loves me, who has a vocation for me, right? I have to have a radical hope that he's going to whisper that to my heart so that I'll know. And when it gets hard, that radical hope gets stirred up so that I can act. And I have to love him above all things, above myself, above my husband, above my children. And even in the most difficult times, strive to serve him in that way. So you take that faith, hope, and love in your vocation and in your identity, and you flip it over into these hard things that we're going through right now, and it's the same thing. Yeah, Yeah. you've said that beautifully, actually. We have to love Jesus and love God as he loved us on the cross, which means it's going to hurt. It means we're going to bleed. It means we're going to cry in pain. It means we're going to have to let go. It means we're going to not be able to breathe because there's a sword in our side. It means our head is going to feel like the weight of a cannonball because we can barely hold it up under that crown of thorns it means that we have to have that radical hope that radical hope that god has brought us to this moment and as saint francis de sales said he will give us the grace to walk through this moment with him he will provide everything that we need exactly when we need it and not one second before and that leads us to this heroic faith yeah this faith in God, this faith in Jesus, and that the Holy Spirit whom he left with us as the superhero of encouragement is gonna remain for God is faithful and he is true and he has never once left us and we are not ever abandoned at any moment. We might not hear him, we might not feel him. And that's from Satan, that's not from anywhere else. He wants you to be in doubt. He wants you to be in sadness. He wants you to be in confusion and in chaos because if he can keep you there, then he's going to distract you from keeping your eyes on the cross. We are given as Catholics, this beautiful gift of redemptive suffering. Mm. Nothing is lost. No sin is left unrestored. Mm. No hardship is left unused. No difficulty is left. God uses everything. As I said before, he uses every triumph, every trial, every victory, every pain, every challenge for our good and his glory. 
If the pandemic has taught me anything, it is the weakness of my own prayer life. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It is the lack of radical hope that I had in my own heart. And it is this lack of heroic faith that everything's going to be okay because God says it would be. Yes. And I've had to wrestle with that for a year and a half to come to a place where I am not swayed. I am that tree that has the deep roots planted beside the water, as it says in the first Psalm. The first Psalm of David talks about the deep roots and how the tree will bend but not break. Because our heroic faith is in God. Our radical hope is in Jesus Christ. Amen. And the love, the love of the Savior, the love of the one that took every blow for me personally and my sin yeah. is big enough and bold enough to survive it all. Yeah. It's so true. I am, um, gosh, you mess me up every time I talk to you. <laughs> we just need to turn off my camera and you can just talk. Because <laughs> uh, you just, you say it so beautifully, Mary. And I think there's two things as you're speaking that really resonate with me is this this idea of hope. Like I think that so often because we live in an age of comfort and we were talking about this before the podcast, we have reached an age of entitlement. We haven't suffered. We haven't really had to face global difficulty like this in, in my lifetime anyway. And I think that sometimes our hope previously can be based on things like our hope that Jesus will change it or our hope that he will give us this finance or this hope that he will give us this job or this hope that he will change our husband or whatever it is. But actually the hope that he's calling us to is this radical hope. It's actually a hope in him. And and that is the hope that doesn't disappoint. So even if we don't get the things we pray for, that we still have to hold on to this radical hope because the person of Jesus Christ is hope that's that's what hope is you have to have that radical expectation yes right this expectation that god is going to come and do what needs to be done not what mary wants not what we want (laughs) now not what i want what i think it should be Mm -hmm. right i can only see my lane of traffic i can't see anybody else's he sees everything he sees all of it all at once and so he knows exactly the kind of breaking, exactly the kind of um, suffering, exactly the kind of challenge that is going to create within us a need for him above our own comfort and our own satisfaction. We have to cling to him, right? That's why I use the word hold loosely to your expectations. Mm -hmm. Because if you cling, then you're too attached. And when he takes it or he allows it to be taken, it's going to hurt like nobody's business. But when we're holding loosely to it, we're not attached to it. We're attached to the prayer. We're attached to the work. We're attached to doing the next right thing, but we're not attached to the outcome because that belongs to God and God alone. And so we hold loosely to these things so that when the wind of the Holy Spirit comes and they're taken from us, we're not, it doesn't hurt because we were just holding loosely, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? That means that we draw even closer to that water, to that living spring. We draw even closer to our Lord. Mm -hmm. We rely on him and not ourselves. We're so self-reliant that a pandemic had to come and had to show us all Mm. that we ain't got nothing compared to what Jesus can provide for us. Yeah. We're so self-sufficient. Everything is self. Everything is comfort. And so he allowed a situation in the world to take that from us. Mm. And we haven't, our, my generation especially has never had that experience. Yeah, that's true. It's so so all brand new. Yep. And and it's really hard. Like I know here in Australia where, you know, (coughs) Victoria, one of the states, is in its fifth lockdown. And, you know, psychologically, spiritually, financially, this is it's becoming really tough. And, 
Sydney as well, they've just they've had their lockdown extended. The, the whole country a year later, we're still going to lockdowns and and just the um the emotional cost and the toll that that's taking. I know for us. Sorry. The isolation. Absolutely. And I think this is one of the things that, you know, Satan loves that. He loves to pick us off from our tribe because when we're isolated, we're vulnerable. We're vulnerable to his lies. We're vulnerable to temptation. And I was actually in adoration because in Canberra, we haven't had a lockdown, praise God. And I was able to go to adoration. I was just praying. I was reflecting on Jesus. We have the on this huge cross above the altar. It's beautiful. But I was looking at that, just thinking about that final temptation, you know, of Satan to Jesus, to, you know, why have you abandoned me, Lord? You know, this, and if Jesus can push through that temptation, like with him we can too. And I often think, and I was comparing that final temptation of Jesus to the first sin in the garden, and the first sin was really the doubting of God's faithfulness and the doubting of God's goodness. And I think it's so easy for us in these times to begin to doubt where he's gone, what's he doing. But we have to blindly trust that he is in control of this somehow and he is always good and he's always faithful. And so... I know that in our life, I mean, I shared in this podcast last year, like we've just had so much loss over the last 12 months um, in terms of relationship, family. We've lost our business because of the pandemic. And I was sharing with you, we've just uh, experienced a second suicide of um, friends really close to us this past week. And walking my kids through that again, I have three children and, you know, walking them through a second suicide. The first young man was only 13. This second boy was 16. And coming from really good, faithful homes, um, you know, and and that's that's been big. And then people close to us suffering with cancer or, you know, there's lots of people suffering with mental illness and just the toll that that's taking. And there's just a huge cross that we're being asked to carry at the moment. And I know that in my life, I guess, just realising what the lessons that I'm learning in all of this is, to lean in to the Lord more, this utter dependence that, you know, I've always been a prayerful person, but now my prayer is in me all day. It's not, I mean, I have my time to pray. Yeah. But I feel like my whole being is a prayer now. Like I, I, Jesus, I'm so aware of him in me throughout the day and communing with him. And in some ways, if that's what I've got out of all of this suffering, well, that's perhaps what he wanted to lead me to. I think he's leading a lot of people to that place of utter dependence. And, and as Father Jacques Philippe said, you know, to consent to that which we haven't consented, like so much is happening. We're, we're not choosing this. This is things are being ripped from people, taken. There's extraordinary loss. But in the midst of that, what are our options? To become hard and bitter and resentful and then our hearts close down and we can no longer be receptive to the Holy Spirit or or to the word of God so the only option in my mind is we just have to fight and we it's a fight to stay open I know I have to fight every day in prayer for my heart to stay open to the Lord well remember the scripture created me a new heart oh Lord you know Um, soft right take out the stony hearts and created me a new heart Um, there are many people at the beginning of this pandemic that had a stony heart and they're now a year and a half in it and they have a new heart and they're in a totally different place. There are those that thought that they had a really nice, great relationship with the Lord that have been tested in ways, um, that, you know, they're not sure they believe anymore. Mm. And so again, it comes, uh, it, you said it beautifully when you said, I have to depend on him. I have to lean into him right? We have to do, as Elizabeth Ann Seton used to say, the next right thing. Mm -hmm. That is it. That is all he is asking us to do. He is not asking us to worry about next Friday. He's asking us to remain in the sacrament of the present moment because yesterday is gone and cannot be fixed. Tomorrow is a gift that has not been given. Mm -hmm. He has given us today. He's given us this conversation right now. So how can we, in this conversation, inspire, encourage, pray for, bring about knowledge to the the love of the Lord and who he is and who he desires to be. His greatest desire is to be in relationship with us. Yes. And he's given us 
many, many opportunities in the last year and a half to be in relationship with him. Yeah. And my relationship with him today looks completely different from my relationship a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. I have had been through a lot of things, a lot of very hard things. I have buried a child. I have a marriage that is proof that God exists and that he loves us because that's the only way it stayed how it is. So I, I, I've lost my father. My husband has lost both parents. We've been through, you know, you talk about businesses closing and I mean, just all of these horrible things happening. But at the end of the day, I have God. Yeah. And he has remained faithful and is with me. And therefore, if I trust him completely with my very next breath, that he will provide the bread that is needed when we are hungry, that he will provide the shelter that is needed when we have no place to go, that he will provide the community that will take our hand and walk with us, then I have a very rich life. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's what happens when things are stripped away from us. That's what happens when we let go of attachments. He's really, really been working on me with attachment to things and attachments to people. Mm -hmm. You know, my husband and I were actually discussing tonight. I'm like, am I going to be alone? And if I'm alone, will I be okay? And the secret to that is I'm never, ever alone. Mm -hmm. Only when I choose to be. Yeah. Only when I close that door to him. Am I truly ever alone? And if Mother Teresa, with her beautiful example of 60 years of faithful service, where she felt not one consolation from Christ, and yet she continued to put one foot in front of the other and do as he had asked her to do, if she can do it, yeah. what stops me from doing it? If our grandparents can suffer through a second world war and starvation and bread lines and rationing and no church and all of those things and come out of it with a family intact and a faith intact, then I can do without my Amazon. I can do without my Starbucks. Pistic, pistic. I can do, yeah. You know, without those, those things in life that are just, they're not essential. Yeah. Does it make it easy? No, none of this is easy. None of it's easy. But it becomes easier when we keep our eyes on yes. the cross. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I, I mean, you would have seen the show Chosen, that beautiful series. Oh, my gosh. Right. Like if, if people have not seen it, you have to see it's the most brilliant portrayal of Jesus' life. But, you know, just there, I, I think it's yet to come, but I often I'm waiting for this scene in, in the show of where um, Peter steps out of the boat, you know, and Jesus is calling him. And what happens when he takes his eyes off Jesus, he sinks. And I think for us so often it, this temptation is so strong right now for us to take our eyes off Christ because there's so much pain and there's so much difficulty. But it's just, I think, if, if anything, this interview, I just really want to speak into the hearts of women, encourage them to just keep their eyes on Christ, like above the water, like all of this stuff is happening around us. That is true. And it's objectively really difficult. But if we can just keep our eyes fixed on Christ, walking towards him in blind faith, I think that's the only way we, we navigate these times. And I, I want to offer some practical ways to do that. Yes. Yeah. You know, how do I do that? Because a lot of people say to me, oh, Mary, how can you be so joyful when you've buried a child? This for a year and a half, how can you be? Okay, here, it's very, it's very simple. And yet it's the hardest thing you'll ever do. Number one, control what you read. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Fill your mind with scripture, with, with the books of the saints. Fill your mind with um, good things. I'm not saying don't read a fiction novel. If that brings you rest, great. I mm -hmm. happen to love murder mysteries now, you know, and, and twisting <laughs> stories. But like, um, but but fill your mind with good things. If watching the news or being on social media yeah. um, twists your perspective, then don't shut it down. Just shut it off. That's good advice. 
And, you know, and then if you're like, but Mary, I need something that goes on during the day. Like a lot of women, they just don't like to be in the silence. I'm like, there's praise and worship music. Feel that, do that. There's classical music, do that. You know, um, just fill your mind and your life with peace. Absolutely. Even in the midst of all of this insanity, we still can choose peace and joy. Because when our peace comes from the Lord, our joy is unshakable. Yeah. You know, I was um, walking with a woman recently and her husband had died of cancer. They had six young children. And she was just, she just kept saying the one thing as her husband was dying was the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. And she just kept saying it until she believed it, until she felt it. And I think what you're saying is these practical strategies and tools are so crucial at the moment, just reading the word of God and just putting it in post-it notes and just speaking it. I think there's real power in the declaration of the spoken word that when we declare out loud um, these promises of, of Christ, then that has immense power. And I love going back to the start of the interview where you spoke about being in a dressing room and that horrible white light that shows up all the yucky bits of us in in the mirror of the dressing room and that that you liken that to the voice of Satan. I think that's so true. So we have to turn up the volume of of the Lord in our life and we do that through through those ways. Pardon me. Oh, you're fine. (coughs) I call them but God statements. Yeah. Lord, I am afraid. Mm. I'm afraid my husband's going to lose his job. But God says... And then you fill it in with the scripture. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. He is faithful and true. He will provide all that is needed. Yeah. Um, whatever that is. I have, but God statements all over my house. Mm-hmm. I read them all the time mm-hmm. when I'm feeling doubt, when I'm questioning a decision, when I am afraid of something, when I'm discerning to do something or not to do something, always go to the word of God. It is the greatest, the Bible is the greatest love letter ever written to us. It is God's pursuit of us. Mm -hmm. And it speaks to you differently in every season of your life. You could read the same passage from Matthew once a year, and it's going to mean something completely different Mm -hmm. because you're a different person than you were a year ago. That's right. So when we fill our mind and we fill our heart with the truth that God has provided for us, then the truth shall shut you free. Amen. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think just this call at the moment, and, and again, I want to really encourage the women to just press hard into the heart of God, into prayer, fasting, rosary at the moment. I think there's not much that, you know, in some ways that we can control, but those things we can. That beautiful book by Viktor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning, he said, you know, the last thing that can never be taken from us is our ability to choose. And I I think we need to be reminded of that because when things feel so out of control, we feel like we have lost control. But the truth is we still have control over our faith and our our choices in terms of what we're choosing. The only person that you can control is yourself. Absolutely. You control. We have to always remember that our thoughts lead to our emotions and our emotions to our actions. We get to tell our emotions what to do. We get to instruct them on how they can help us. They are not the boss of us. And over the past year and a half, you've seen a lot of people who have given into the emotion instead of being able to clearly think through it and direct their thoughts accordingly. And so we have to, I think scriptures help us do that. Uh, Praise and worship helps us do that. Adoration, if you're able to go, helps us do that. Mass, the sacraments, all of that redirects our focus and reprioritizes our life. Mm -hmm. And we focus on him and the gift that our life truly is. Whether it's filled with suffering or filled with celebration, it is all gift. Mm. Absolutely. Amen. Well, I could talk to you all day. Do you want to go all night? (laughs) Oh, I could. I'm menopausal. I never sleep. Oh, you so could really- do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, that's all ahead of me. <laughs> Another trial, right? <laughs> it, you know, it's the gift. It, it, I, I didn't used to think of it as a gift. 
Okay. And as I've gone through this last year and a half, it is a gift. It's, it's, it's my body telling me that everything's okay. You know, that I'm going through um, kind of saying goodbye to a season of my life. And, and it's just your body's way of saying goodbye. So um, I appreciate it in that way now. I didn't five years ago, but okay. it took me a while. I got there. Okay, we might have to do another podcast on <laughs> that one day. <laughs> it's a fun one. Fun. <laughs> Fun, fun. Oh, Mary, thank you. I, I, you know, uh, the past few weeks I haven't um, put out a podcast on the Genius Podcast. We've been busy with work and and then obviously these deaths have been quite tragic for us. Um, but I really, in prayer, and I was really convicted of these words, become a beacon of hope. Mm. And I felt like even though I'm personally in suffering, God is still calling me. It's it's like the widow. She was, she You know, God didn't honour the big sacrifices from the people that were comfortable and could make their sacrifices, but he honoured that true sacrifice because she gave what little she had. And so I was really convicted just to to be doing the podcast on a regular basis because this is a voice that speaks into the heart of hundreds of women um, and to become a beacon of hope. And so I just want to encourage women uh, to go forth wherever they are planted, whatever their sphere of influence is right now, and it might be in lockdown in your home, but to become a beacon of hope where you're planted, where God is calling you right here, right now. Be radical and be revolutionary in your hope. Mm. Be Christ to whomever you come in contact with. And for those that are in lockdown, that's going to be their families. And they might be really tired of being in the same four walls with those people but remember that they are gift they are gift and um sometimes a gift gets you just want to return it but unfortunately that's not the kind of gift you can return Mm -hmm. so if we change our hearts if we are able to reset our mind with the opportunity that one day we're going to look back at this time and we're not going to have that forced time together people are going to choose to be a part and how sad it would be if we missed the opportunity to create a place of peace and a place of hope in the center of our homes Mm -hmm. and um i know for me now that we in the united states are no longer on lockdown um i cherish i cherish the time that we were all here together because here my son is going to be married soon and he's beginning a new life And, um, and he won't be in my home anymore. Mm -hmm. And I had that time. It was, it was not what I wanted at the time, but it's what God allowed. And therefore look for the gift in it. There's always a gift in the midst of suffering. There's always a lesson to be learned. And sometimes it takes looking back at it to see it, but it's always there.